Test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You'll hear two people organizing a going away party for a mutual friend. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hey Bruce, looks like we got some planning to do for Albert's going away party, right? There are certainly some things we have to talk about now. Yeah, that's better than doing everything at the last minute. Okay, so I can write some notes as we talk. Sure thing. So, when should we have the party? Hmm. He goes to Thailand on the twenty sixth of August. Okay. Let's have it on the twenty fourth then. Yes. Let me see. That's a Friday. That'd be perfect. Now, where should we have it? At a bar or a club? You know, I think he would like something really intimate. Nothing too loud. A restaurant would be good. Maybe the Apple Tree Grill. Great place. Sounds good. Okay. Now we have to think about who to invite. Well, his best friend from college. Sure. And his cousins, right? Oh yes, his co-workers. Yeah, okay, his co-workers and his boss. Any other people? How about his yoga classmates? Hmm, he does love yoga, but that might be too many people. I suppose so. I can email and text message the invitations. When should I send them? We should send them out soon, but not too early. How about the sixteenth of August then? Well, why not give it a few more days? The thirteenth? All right, I think that's a good time too. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. Okay, now we have to think of a gift. Should we all get one? No, I was thinking we could all give money for the party and the gift. You know, something really nice. Yeah, that'd be better than getting him little things individually. I can ask for the money. Thanks for doing that. How much should we ask for? I think we should ask for maybe fifteen dollars each. Is that too much? No, not at all. He's going away for two years. That would give us about one hundred and fifty dollars. That's a good amount. Yeah, well, I'm thinking we could get him something practical. Yes, especially since he's going abroad. Something he could use. Something that's also portable. We could get him an article of clothing, perhaps, or maybe even a pair of shoes. Hmm. Shoes are nice, but they might wear out easily, especially where he's going. Maybe a book light. A what? Yeah, he loves to read, and a book light would be very convenient when he travels. Okay, that's one good gift idea. Did you write that down? Yep. Now we need to think about reservations at the restaurant. Well, we should get their big banquet room, yeah. Yes, definitely. Should we ask the restaurant to prepare a buffet? Isn't that expensive? No, I don't think it is. A buffet dinner sounds cheaper than everyone ordering individual meals. Definitely. How about drinks? They can buy drinks themselves or bring their own. Okay. Yeah, it would cost too much if we bought drinks ourselves. Certainly. We have to ask someone to bring an MP3 player. The restaurant has speakers, and we can hook it up for music. Sounds good. Actually, there is one more thing that I thought we should do since Albert is leaving for such a long time. 
What were you thinking of? Maybe we could have a slideshow of all the fun times we've had. Hmm, that'll take a little bit of work, but I think it's a great idea. Actually, in the invitation, can you ask for some photos people have of him? Yeah, definitely. I can scan them or people can send me digital photos they have. All right, I'll tell them when I send out the invitations. Then I can make a little presentation. Ha, <laughs> I can't wait to see his reaction. Yeah, especially that one picture where... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speaker talking about saving energy in the home. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 12. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 12. Many thanks for inviting me along to talk about saving energy in the home. This is a key issue for many people who now find themselves on tight budgets. So today I'd like to spend a few minutes going through some simple tips to help keep those energy bills to a minimum. I'll start with some easy, cheap ideas before talking about more major solutions later. I think we're all aware of the importance of insulating our homes, and although I'd advise you to get it done, I appreciate it can sometimes be inconvenient to have building work carried out. And though they're growing in popularity, having solar panels installed on the roof isn't a cheap enough option for many of us to consider seriously. So what other steps can we take? Well, most people will make a point of turning the heating down when temperatures outside rise, but they ignore other equally useful ways of saving energy when they're making dinner or doing their weekly laundry. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. If you're living in a relatively new apartment or house, you're probably blessed with a cosy, draft-free living space. But for those of us in older properties, the chances are there are gaps all over the place where cold air is getting in. Walk around your home and place the back of your hand around window frames. Can you feel cold air coming in from outside? Get down on your knees at the doors. Is there a draft at floor level? Fix these drafts with some cheap draft excluders and savings in heating bills will begin straight away. And are you using the latest energy saving light bulbs? I'm not recommending you go around your entire property throwing out older ones and replacing them all immediately. But next time a bulb goes, make sure you buy an energy efficient alternative. And what about heating? If you have radiators in every room, do you need them all switched on throughout the day? If they're on timers, set them efficiently. Then there's the laptop or your TV. Do you leave them switched on overnight or on standby? Don't waste money. Turn them off. And that goes for lights as well. You'd be surprised how many people leave them on when they go out. There are also guaranteed savings to be made in the kitchen. 
I'm always telling my husband not to overfill the kettle when he makes a cup of tea. Why boil more water than you actually need? When you consider how many times that kettle gets used every day, you'll appreciate just how much electricity can be saved by boiling what you need and no more. And the next time you're cooking pasta or potatoes, keep a lid on the pot. The water will boil much more quickly than if you leave it off. And if you've bought yourself a pressure cooker or steamer and it's sitting in the cupboard never being used, get it out. They're much more efficient than pots and pans. Now, the refrigerator and freezer. If the fridge is next to the cooker, it's having to work harder to stay cold. But as I'm giving cheap, easy solutions here, a kitchen redesign might be out of the question. Still, there are other energy-saving steps you can take. Keep an eye on the temperature control. We often forget to turn it down in the colder winter months when a high setting is unnecessary. Also, remember to defrost the freezer frequently and try not to overfill it, as this isn't the most efficient way of using it. The washing machine is another potential money saver. A lot of people wash at 40 degrees Celsius, but it's often okay to drop the temperature down to 30 degrees Celsius with similar results. And remember to either wash full loads or select the half load program. Again, a surprising number of people forget to do this. And is it really necessary to dry your clothes in a tumble dryer? If you have a garden or a yard, hang them outside. Or if you're drying them inside, get yourself a cheap clothes rail rather than hanging things over radiators, which robs you of valuable heat. Now, let's turn to some of the help our local council is offering to householders to save energy. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You're going to hear an explanation of how a school chancellor will be chosen. The chairman is explaining the process to two students, Sarah and Arnold. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good evening, everyone. I hope you've both taken a look at the documents given to you. As student members of the University Chancellor Selection Committee, you will help to select a new Chancellor for our university. This person will be responsible for the operations, academics and budget of the university. Today, I want us to talk about getting feedback from other students and about the selection process. OK, so what exactly will our roles be? You both are full members of the committee representing the interests of the student body. When we go over the applicants for Chancellor, your votes will count the same as other committee members. The same as other faculty and administrators? OK. Indeed. It is important to have student input in the selection process. That will be part of your duties as committee members, to talk to the student body and get a feeling for what they want in a new Chancellor. You will report back to me, the committee chairman, and then talk to the rest of the committee. I suggest that you contact the student newspaper and ask them to do some sort of survey. You both can also talk to the heads of various student organisations and gauge their opinions. All right. What sort of questions should we ask? Well, if you know of any issues important to the student body as a whole, you can ask them about that. I know that there was a recent increase in student fees. Since the Chancellor is in charge of the budget process, he or she will certainly be involved with that. Well, that is one topic that everyone can be asked about. A question about financial issues? OK. You also mentioned going to different student groups. I was wondering, would that be appropriate? 
If the chancellor is the head of the whole university, is it that important to ask the opinions of a smaller individual organization? Definitely, they may be smaller organizations, but they often represent a wide number of students. It would be in the best interests of the school to have a chancellor that understands the needs of not just the community as a whole, but of the different parts that make up that whole. I see. I guess it would be best to contact the leadership group of each club and group. Yes, actually, that would probably be the most efficient way to get their opinion. Before you hear the rest of the explanation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. After you get a feel for what the student body thinks, I would like you to create a report for me. As chairman, I am responsible for making sure the different views of the students, faculty, and the administration are heard. So, what happens after we submit our report to the rest of the committee? We'll start with the rest of the selection procedures. We have an open process, meaning anyone who wants to can apply to be chancellor. That way. We will have the widest available pool to choose from. Of course, the first step will be to narrow down the field of applicants. Looking at their background and work experience, we will end up with fifteen candidates. There will be further background checks on the remaining candidates. These checks include talking to the references a candidate has listed, as well as asking about them at any previous institution they may have worked at. This is quite a rigorous process, isn't it? It has to be. The chancellor represents the university, so we need the best qualified person. After the background checks, we will contact candidates and ask them to come in for an interview before the committee. I remember hearing that we'll also be sitting in on those interviews. It'll be difficult to think of good questions to ask all those candidates. Well, I think the committee as a whole will do that. Ah,、uh, okay. That sounds like the best way. Yes, it's quite a rigorous interview process. Each candidate will have to come in a second time. The final five candidates will then be asked to come in a third time and actually interact with some of the community members here. After the committee chooses the finalist, that one name will be sent to the board of trustees to be approved. They will also go over the candidate's material before having an up or down vote on him or her. Then that person becomes the chancellor of the university. It is good to have so many people working together on this. I'm sure we'll find a great chancellor. Yes. Actually, there are many interesting stories about past selection committees. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a type of fundraising for business called crowdfunding. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Today we are continuing our look at funding opportunities for small startup businesses. The emergence of social media has given companies the ability to connect with fans and potential customers directly. 
On the back of the growth in social media, a model of raising finance has emerged known as crowdfunding. This revolutionary way of raising finance began with micro-lending in the 90s. More recently, an equity-based model has emerged that allows people to invest directly in a new company. We're going to examine this in more detail later, but let's turn first to a third model, which I'll term a fan-based model. With this model of crowdfunding, individuals are encouraged to give an amount of money to support the launch of a project or initiative without the promise of any financial return. Instead, there's a reward for donating. This contrasts with the micro-lending model, which would require a return on investment, and the equity-based scheme, which may offer shares. Crowdfunding portals, or websites, allow the business concerned to present the initiative along with the financial target required. There's a fixed time limit for fundraising, and if the target amount is reached, all donations are paid to the company or individual. Whether it's an author planning to write a new book, an independent film company looking to make a new film, or a technology company with an idea for an app, the person or company needing funding would turn to its fan base for support. This is managed through one of the many crowdfunding online portals that have emerged. Of course, a fan or supporter of a particular initiative is likely to give money anyway. But donation-based crowdfunding will often make donating even more attractive by offering a rewards-based incentive scheme. Let's take a film company, for example, that needs funding for a new film. For a small, set donation, the donor might be offered a free ticket to the premiere or a DVD of the film. A larger set donation might be rewarded by the chance to attend a launch event when the film goes live. Those people who make bigger donations could even be offered the chance to meet the cast of the film, whilst the highest level donation could see the person's name mentioned in the film credits. For companies that already have a significant fan base, crowdfunding offers a fantastic opportunity to raise money quickly from a large number of people, each of whom donates just a small amount of money. Compare this to the time and effort that would be needed to sell your idea to investors or your bank manager, particularly in an age when raising finance can be difficult. The company may also have links with partner companies or organizations that run fundraising events. In this case, you can significantly increase participation by working with these organizations to promote your crowdfunding project. Another significant advantage is that you can reach out to your fan base for feedback on the project while it's being developed, thus making the final product more appealing. Crowdfunding enables you to raise awareness of the product at an early stage, thus increasing the potential for sales. With so many people behind you, it can also act as a great incentive to get the best possible product out on time and on budget. However, there are disadvantages to bear in mind. The model can be described as all or nothing. If you don't reach the monetary target required in the agreed time, all promises of donations are cancelled and no money is paid, leaving you back at square one. Should this happen, or still worse, you receive the funding but are unable to come up with the product, not only will your fans end up disappointed, but the portal will record the fact that you failed to reach your target or that the initiative failed. Fulfilling all the pledges that you've made to people can also be very time-consuming. For example, remembering to send out copies of books or free cinema tickets can sometimes be forgotten in the excitement and frenzy of launching your product. People sometimes forget to factor in the cost of rewards when calculating profit margins. But these can be significant. And finally, if you have a small fan base, for example, you're a new company, or have a small social media footprint, raising awareness of your initiative will be challenging. These drawbacks aside, donation-based crowdfunding is a wonderful opportunity for individuals or small startups to raise funds for that exciting new project whilst reaching out and connecting to the people who are most likely to support and promote your work for you. That is the end of part four. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers.